You're listening to the Sabina Road Baptist Sermon Series. We hope this message greatly impacts your life. For more information on the mission and ministries of Sabina Road Baptist Church in Tucson, Arizona, visit us online at sabinaroad.org. It's great to be here, church. It's great to be here, church. <laughs> We're in the house of the Lord today. Could be on the golf course. Could be in a swimming pool. But you chose to be here. I'm telling you, friend, that's a good decision. Thank you, music team. Man, they sound good. <laughs> that sound really good. Thank you. Please turn your Bibles to Galatians chapter 1. We're looking at verses 1 through 9. I finally found where the clock is at. I didn't know where it was at last Sunday. Which to me means I get to preach as long as I want to. Uh, but now that I know where it's at, I guess I have to be respectful. <laughs> the title of today's message is The Gospel That Saves and Sustains Us. The gospel that saves and sustains us. Galatians chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. You know, I have a master key in my pocket I've been given. Because you're the pastor and it's important. They even wrote M on it. So I would know what I'm supposed to go, what I'm supposed to do. And I can use this key in virtually every building with a couple exceptions. I can get into... Uh, the Sunday school rooms and every single one I can use this particular key and it can get me in. It's very useful for what I need to do here in this church. But this could be a problem if I use this master key, I, I get in the particular door and I put it in my pocket. Because the problem is, is the master key seems to open all the other doors, which is very helpful. And so it's not just that I want to get in the front door, but I want to get into all of them if it's going to be particularly useful for me. The reason why I use this illustration is this, friend. There's a lot of people that have accepted the gospel. If you're a believer and you've trusted Christ, you have accepted the gospel as true. But many Christians see the gospel as sort of the ABCs of their Christian faith. They say, okay, I've, I've got the gospel figured out. Maybe you trusted Christ as a young child like I did. It's not complex. It's profound, but not complex. They say, okay, I've got the gospel figured out. Now let me move on with my Christian life. The problem is that is not the way of the Bible pictures the gospel. You see, the gospel is the master key to Christianity. It gives you a relationship with God. It opens the door for relationship with Him. But the gospel, then you don't get to put it in your pocket and say, okay, then I'm done with the gospel. No, the Bible says that the gospel unlocks every other aspect to growing in our relationship with the Lord. See, I want to have an abundant, exciting, victorious Christian life, and you must have the master key of the gospel. And that's what we're going to be talking about here today and a lot through the book of Galatians. See, the gospel isn't just for entering God's kingdom, but for living in it. Today, we'll begin our series for the book of Galatians called Living Free and Dying Hard. I like that one. It sounded kind of tough. And uh, so that's the title of the Galatians series that we're going to be looking at for several weeks. Living free and dying hard. In this book, we'll stutter the, study the dangers of legalism, a, a rule-based living saying, I can, I can make myself righteous before God by, by what I do and, and following rules. That's legalism and that will be strongly combated in this series. We'll also see the beauty of love-filled obedience, which is the opposite end of legalism. We'll see what it means to be a true believer, what, how we find our identity in Christ. Our, our, our culture is very confused about identity right now. 
And here's the wonderful news, friends. The Bible says who you are and what you're supposed to do. It answers that question. It tells us how to change. How to really change. Have you ever said, Lord, I've tried these different things and, and I still have these habits, but I, I haven't changed it. Galatians tells us how we can really change. So we'll be talking about that all through this exciting book of Galatians. But today, my hope and my prayer is that you would learn to embrace and guard the gospel of grace. We learn to embrace and guard the gospel of grace. So look with me in Galatians chapter 1. We'll look in verse 1 through 9. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me, to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Look at verse 6. <laughs> Paul says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and the turning to a different gospel. This is very unusual. The Apostle Paul always, always, always in his letters begins with the greeting and then he goes to thanksgiving, which was how you did letters in ancient times. And he skips all of that and skips right here into what we just said in verse 6. He is all business right here. Follow me in verse 7. It says, not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want you, you to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you receive, let him be accursed. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful to be in the house of the Lord today. Lord, I pray that you would meet with us today. This is not a time of sanctimonious actions that mean nothing to our hearts, Lord, but that you will come and meet with us this morning. That you will speak to our hearts. Lord, that you would change us. Lord, we love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we delve into the book of Galatians, I'm going to give us a little background. I know you're thinking, oh man, a history lesson, this is going to be so boring. And it might be, but uh, just hang on, okay? We're, uh, if we're going to understand what's happening in the book of Galatians, you're going to have to understand what's happening in the background and the context of Galatians if we're going to interpret Scripture correctly. So, so, so bear with me here a little bit, okay? So Paul was a church planting missionary. You guys know that. He's been on famous missionary journeys and, and he's gone to a lot of different places all around the world. But he would continue to supervise uh, his, his churches that he began, that he, the church plants by letters. And we're familiar. We call these the epistles. That's what we see in the New Testament. Some debate who he was writing to in this particular, uh, this particular letter. But it's likely to the Roman province of Galatia. I know we've got a, a map that's um, going to come up here in a second. And, and uh, uh, Galatia was a province of Rome. And, and in that province, we know that through the book of Acts that Paul went to Iconium, he went to Lystra, and he went to Derbe and some other places that he began churches there. You can see it up there, right? This is just like glass, right? And so, uh, so the, the Apostle Paul went here and started these churches. Oh, we can get rid of the map now. But this is where uh, likely the Galatian church is that he is referring to. But there were social and racial divisions in the church at Galatia. You have to understand, friend, that the, the gospel began in Israel, right? It began with the Jews and then it moved on to the rest of the world. But you have to understand that the Jews live different than the rest of the world. It's a different location. They eat differently, they worship differently, they praise differently. as a completely different context than the rest of the world. 
So when the gospel that began in Israel began to spread to the rest of the world, there began to be conflicts, as you can imagine. Because the rest of the world, the one, the places that we just looked at, and, and uh, Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey, is where um, the Galatian churches would uh, be at. They had a whole different way of life that came into conflict. And that's one of the things that Paul is going to be fighting with and uh, addressing here. Um, this is crucial to understanding the book of Galatians. So, so, so listen with me. There was a, a group of Jewish leaders called the Judaizers. And they were attacking Paul's gospel. Paul was doing all this hard work planting churches. And then these Judaizers, these uh, sort of Jewish, sort of Christian people, leaders, were coming behind Paul to his churches. And then they were bad-mouthing him and his gospel, which has got to be pretty frustrating. And they were saying things like, okay, yes, Jesus is good. Oh, we worship him. He is everything. But we just need a little bit more. We need the, the ceremonial law of Moses. So you've got to have Jesus, but you've got to eat the right way, like we do. And if you're a man, then you have to be circumcised. So Jesus, absolutely. Jesus saved, but you've got to add a couple more of these things to be really right with God. And Paul is ticked that they're doing this because friends that is a false gospel and we're going to get into that today and all throughout the book of Galatians Paul is astonished he is angry not just with the new believers but particularly with the false teachers and not in some kind of petulant way like we get most of the time Paul is angry like a loving father would be when, uh, your, when your children are going wayward, when they're doing things that they shouldn't. And so Paul is upset. And you're going to see that in the context of the Galatians. He calls them foolish later on. Um, that helps us understand what we are studying here in the book of Galatians. And we'll be referring to this battle that he's having much um, of this sermon series. So look with me in point number one, okay? We see the source of the gospel message. So where it comes from, the source of the gospel message. We'll look at kind of verses 1 through 3 and verses 8 through 9. So he says in verse 1, it says, Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia. See, in addition to undermining Paul's teaching, the Judaizers were undermining him as a person. They were saying, like, who is Paul to tell you these things anyway? I mean, where is he getting this message? He wasn't one of the original 12 disciples, one of the 12 apostles. So should you really be listening to him? Does he really know what he's talking about? They were going on an old-fashioned smear campaign. Have you seen the, the negative ads that come out during political rallies? Those are my favorite ones to watch because the screen goes from color to like dark gray. And then this guy starts talking this really evil voice and it's like, John Russo doesn't pay his taxes. Bob Bedell once kicked a puppy. Tim Hatch doesn't put the toilet seat down. Can you really trust a guy like that? Right? These are, these are, and that's what they were doing. They're saying, if you cannot trust the man, then you cannot trust the message. That's what they're saying. And they said, Paul, who is he really? And so Paul puts much more emphasis on his apostleship here than he normally does. He says, this is not by me. I didn't make this up. He says, this, I'm an apostle by God. God made me an apostle. Jesus Christ made me an apostle. Paul did not make Paul an apostle. To attack Paul was to attack the gospel of grace. Verse 1 drives home the uniqueness of the first apostles. See, they had been selected, the apostles that is, had been tutored by Jesus Christ. They had seen the risen Christ. You see that these qualifications in Mark chapter 3 and Acts chapter 1. And Paul says he was not con con commissioned by any man but directly from Christ. And we see that in Acts chapter 9 that he had the, on the Damascus road, Jesus Christ came to him 
personally, and we know in Arabia, Jesus Christ himself discipled Paul for three years. So Paul is a legitimate apostle. And he has a legitimate message to share. See, apostle, the word apostle means to be sent. Now just so if there's any confusion about this, there is other lowercase a apostles in the rest of the New Testament. And they do things and they're sent out to death with the church, but they don't have the same authority that the capital A apostles did who knew Christ, were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write Scripture. And that is paramount in understanding Scripture and understanding the book of Galatians. Paul is saying, whether externally, teachers, writers, thinkers, or preachers, whether internally, feelings, sensations, or emotions, he said, all of them must be measured by the gospel of grace that was given by the apostles that Jesus Christ made. He says, look, look at me in verse uh, 8 and 9. He says, but even if we, Paul even includes himself in this, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. It says, the gospel that is preached by these apostles is the chalk line. We've all used the chalk line and, and you do it to measure fences and you say, okay, this is straight and if it's not lining up with the chalk line, then it's crooked. He says, this is the chalk line, the gospel message given by the apostles, and this is what judges us. We are not apostles over Scripture. Scripture has authority over us. That's important to understand, that we submit our lives to Scripture. The apostles, big A, are done. God used them, praise the Lord, but that's that we have a different authority now, and that is God's Word inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so we base our lives off of Scripture. It stands over us. Amen. There we go. Okay. That's not a popular message. The world says, no, no, no. I'm my own God. I say what's right. I say what's wrong. Don't tell me what I can or cannot do. We'll be going through that a lot in the book of Galatians, so I'm just going to kind of leave that there. But we have to understand that we submit our lives to the gospel authority we see in Scripture. We must submit to it. We see the source of the gospel message is significant. But also we see the substance of the gospel message. Look at verses 4 through 7. The substance of the gospel message. What is it? Who gave himself, talking about, let me back it up at verse 3, sorry. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for, okay, church, you got your Bibles with you? Okay. He gave himself for us. Jesus Christ gave himself for you and I to deliver us to rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. See, many churches, many churches have abandoned the true gospel. What the Bible says is plain and simple, and many churches have abandoned it to their own undoing. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples of how they've done it. Some churches say, well, we're saved because of the level of faith that we have. And, and these type of people who, have, uh, who fit in this category, and maybe you fit in this category. I prayed a prayer when I was six. Um, I really meant it at the time. There's been no evidence. There's been no fruit in my life ever since then. I'm, a, uh, I'm, I'm not a nice person. I've never acted like a nice person. But I prayed a prayer one time then you are putting your faith in your prayer and not in the Savior. It's just not, we're not saved through faith. Sorry, we're, we're saved not through faith, but by it. It's not the amount of faith, but the object of it. Many churches, many people 
I believe in this building today have some commitment that they've prayed a long time ago and they've had a miserable Christian life their whole life because they're not really believers. They don't know the true gospel. Say, we're saved through faith, not by faith. Faith is the conduit to grace. And that's what saves us. Now here's another part that, the, that the people, a, a, a false gospel people have believed. It doesn't really matter what you believe as long as you're a loving and good person. Anybody ever heard that before? You ever tried to share the gospel with somebody before and say, hey man, what do you do? Uh, what do you think about Christ? And they say, well, I never killed anybody. Like that's the metric for righteousness. I never murdered anybody. Well, congratulations. Any other test we want to run through? You're not Adolf Hitler. That's usually what I hear. But get this. A gospel that is only for good people is not the biblical gospel. Why? Because it excludes bad people. And the gospel says, I'm for bad people and for good people. I'm for everybody. And really, people that think they're good are really bad according to biblical standards. And we say, well, the gospel is for good people. Then you're, then you're, then you're uh, forsaking, you're excluding all the people that are bad, that have a rough, checkered past. And friends, that's not the gospel message. The gospel message is for everybody. No matter your background. No matter what you've done. No matter who you are, the gospel can change you. Amen, church. Y'all are awake. Okay, we're here. Okay, that's good. Here's a gospel message. A false gospel. Rule following equals righteousness. And somehow or another, if I am a good enough person get baptized, I give money, I serve on some committee, and that somehow or another, that's the gospel message. Jesus plus some of these things will, will, will make me righteous. And that's not the gospel. That's the opposite of what the gospel is. So let's look briefly at what the gospel message is. Look at verse 4 again. Okay, it says, the gospel of Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age. The gospel of grace is the offer of God's free and unmerited favor towards mankind. Amen. We all experience that. It's the offer of unmerited favor by God. That means you and I cannot merit it. There is nothing that you and I can do or have done that have made ourselves a little bit more worthy than anybody else. That you and I stand guilty before a holy God. But the gospel says that you can be saved anyway. Unmerited favor. That's the gospel of grace. And we must protect this gospel. See, this message of the gospel is that we are helpless and lost and need to be rescued. A lot of the world says, okay, Jesus is a great teacher. That's not what the Bible says about Jesus, although I'm sure he was. The Bible says that Jesus is our rescuer. That he came when we could not save ourselves. And, 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 and people who are drowning in sin don't need a manual. They need a rescuer. When you're drowning and I say, hey, hey buddy, you down there. Turn to page four. It shows you the backstroke, the doggy stroke. It shows you all of those strokes, right? Doggy paddle, whatever you call those things, right? That's not what you need. You need somebody to hop in, pull you out. That's what Jesus did. Amen. He came as our rescuer. He came to deliver us, as it says in verse 4. It came to rescue us is a proper interpretation. Jesus is our rescuer. on behalf he didn't just give us a second chance but he did all we needed to do but couldn't do so if we live a thousand lifetimes we could not stand righteous before a holy God because we are corrupted not just by society or circumstances but our hearts are evil and corrupt we are corrupt from within and only a savior 
that works from within to the outside can save us. He saved not just part of you. He saved all of you. He did all the work of salvation. God, I'm going to work on this. We're going to get there. He did all the work of salvation, brother. He did all the work. Maybe this, this side over here gets it, okay? This side is waking up. He did all the work of salvation left side over here. Or right side, I guess that's how you want to look at it. He did all the work. He did all the work we're ever going to need. My whole life, I've been scrubbing bathtubs and bathrooms with Ajax. <laughs> right? Ajax is great. It's like less than a dollar. That lasts for like three years. I mean, it's amazing. So I'll put that in there, get down on my knees, put a little elbow grease on there, make my wife happy. They're looking good, right? Ajax is where it's at. But I recently come to know about this thing called scrubbing bubbles. <laughs> Done. If you don't know what scrubbing bubbles is, I'm going to tell you, my friend. Scrubbing bubbles, there's a little button in the shower. And you can put it in there. And you push the button once you leave the shower. And it does all the work. It does all the scrubbing. It's like a miracle. You don't got to get down on your knees. You don't got to get dirty. You don't got to waste your time. It does all the work for you. And this is what Paul is saying. The gospel of grace is already done, friends. Jesus Christ did all the work. You don't have to get down on your knees. You don't have to waste your time trying to earn favor from God that you cannot do. God says, through the gospel of grace, you can be saved because Jesus Christ did all the work. There we go. Amen. He did all of it. And Paul reminds us that the, through the gospel, we are brought lower and raised higher than we can ever imagine. The gospel is an offense to us. It's an offense to the world because the gospel says you are weak and you are feeble and you cannot save yourself. I don't like to hear that. I want to believe that I am something special. That I'm a good guy. So when I look at the standards of God, I realize I'm not. That I stand guilty before a holy God. And so the gospel brings me lower, friends, than I am willing to admit here. If you knew the real me, you wouldn't have called me this church. If I knew the real you, I wouldn't have come anyway. <laughs> but the gospel, it brings us low. It brings us low. More than we want to admit. <laughs> but the gospel, through God's grace brings us higher than we could ever imagine. We don't just go from, uh, from, from bad people to good people. We go from lost people to transformed people. We become sons and daughters of God. Not slaves to a God which, which would be perfectly fair, which would be perfectly just, but we become His very own children. And the Bible says later on in the book of Galatians that we become heirs with Christ. That gospel message brings me low and it brings me high. You cannot mix grace and works because one excludes the other. If you want a gospel of grace and works, it's really just a gospel of works. The gospel of grace saves us and saves us completely. A life that embraces works, as Paul will share in this, in this uh, book, in this letter, is destined for failure and disappointment. You have to understand this, friends, and we'll spend more time on this later on, is that God is pleased with you. Not because of what you've done, but because of the Savior. When you trusted Him as your Savior, you have been bought with the precious blood of Christ, and God sees you and judges you and sees you as good as He sees Christ. And Christ is perfect. And that's how God sees you. God is pleased with you. So we don't have to serve saying, I hope, I hope He's pleased with me today. 
I hope this is enough. It's never going to be enough. It's always going to be uncertain and bring disappointment. The gospel of grace says you are pleasing before God. I'll send this caveat before we're done to make sure I'm clear about this. So we're not just saved by grace, but we live by grace. I'm not saying that we don't do righteous things for God. Because here's the amazing part. Once you've been transformed by the gospel, then you're able to. And instead of serving God out of, man, I, I sure hope God's pleased with me today, we understand that we stand righteous and pleasing before a holy God and a heart filled with love and gratefulness for our Father who has saved people who don't deserve it. Then we serve Him out of love. Out of love. So you don't have to feel guilty when a, when a preacher boy is really bringing down the hammer about witnessing to people. No, all you got to do is recognize who you are, what you've been saved from, who God is, and that compels you to serve Him in a love-filled way. You don't have to live in guilt and shame. So the good news of salvation is grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And believers should embrace and guard the uniqueness of the gospel of grace. As we move into the invitation time today, here is the challenge of God's word. Here is the time when we respond to God's word. God's word has been preached, not from me, but from the Holy Spirit, has spoken to your hearts. And we don't get to say, well, that was a great lecture. Congratulations. Now what's happening at Chick-fil-A? No, you say, now how do I respond to the Holy Spirit speaking to me? This is the invitation time. Let me, I, I just want to ask two questions. First, I don't know a lot of people here. And I'm going to have to say that for a couple more weeks, maybe a couple more months until I got everybody figured out. But I, can I ask you this, friend? Are, are you trying to earn salvation? You say, maybe you're a young person. Maybe you're not so young. And you say, you know what, I, 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 I thought that if I cleaned myself up, that maybe Christ would save me. And that's what I've been basing my salvation off. And friend, you need to repent from that. Because that's a false gospel. That's not a real gospel. The gospel says that you trust Christ as your Savior. You repent from sin and trust in Him. And you can be saved and holy and completely saved through the blood of Christ. All you have to do is grab on to that life ring of salvation. Are you depending on your works to save you before a holy God? If you are, turn from that today and trust true grace. Let me ask you this, Christian. Maybe say, you know, I, 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 I am saved. I, I have trusted Christ as my Savior but I don't have a grace-filled life. I kind of thought that after I got saved, I had to do a lot of work to please God. I didn't realize I stood pleasing before Him. And, and I, and I want to stand as a love-filled believer today. I don't want to simply uh, wonder day in and day out if, if I've reached the standard that makes God happy today. So I want to have a grace life that influences every aspect your family life your professional life your church life filled with grace my prayer is let God speak to your hearts today let's pray Father thank you for who you are thank you for what you've done in our life thank you for the gift of grace Lord, forgive us when we think that we can somehow or another add or take away from the gospel. Help us to trust it. Help us to live by it. Help us to be love-filled disciples. Lord, I pray for those in this room who may not know you. They've been relying on things that are not the gospel to save them. Lord, I pray that they would obey you today and trust the true gospel of grace unmerited favor they would come forward they would, they would talk with me or they would talk with one of their friends that they would get right with God before they left here today speak to our hearts love you 
We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.